You good, Carrie? I am, yep. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. We're so happy to have you with us tonight. Uh, we are talking a little bit about hops in Iowa, and we are talking with Carrie Byram tonight. First, I'll introduce myself. My name is Krista Hartzig, and I coordinate the Small Farms Program at Iowa State University Extension and Outreach. Uh, Carrie and I are part of a specialty crop block grant, so we appreciate their funding for the project that we have been working on to kind of help study how hops do in Iowa, how they compare and perform against Pacific Northwest hops, and then how we can help increase consumer demand for hops. So with that, I'm going to introduce Carrie. Uh, Carrie is the owner of Cedar Falls Hops, which is located just outside Cedar Falls, Iowa. She's an experienced horticulturalist with a degree in biology from the University of Northern Iowa and a master's from the University of Delaware. Prior to returning to Iowa, Carrie oversaw the greenhouse production at SeaWorld theme parks and worked for the University of Florida Extension as a horticulture agent. So Carrie, we appreciate your time and expertise tonight. Um, everyone, please feel free as you have questions to kind of drop those in the chat box and I will help monitor those and get those to Carrie. But Carrie, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yep, and like Krista said, um, please ask your questions as we go. And Krista, feel free to interrupt me. I'm going to focus mostly on commercial hops production, but I've included some on like if you want to grow hops at home and how you can do that effectively and to try to help you along in that process too. So let me make sure. Okay. So tonight we are going to talk about a little bit about the history and culture of hops, the anatomy of hops, because especially being in Iowa here where we have so many row crops around us, hops are very, very different compared to most Iowa row crops. So we'll talk about that a little bit. We'll look at what a year looks like growing hops, the structures. Everyone loves to talk about the trellis structures that the hops grow on. So we'll talk about that. Um, care and maintenance, harvesting, and also touch on the future of hops in Iowa here. So a little bit about us. Um, my husband and I were actually living in Florida and moved back to the farm that I grew up on outside of Cedar Falls in 2017. Uh, we are just outside Cedar Falls and currently have seven acres of hops in production. Uh, my dad, who you see in the lower photo there, is my partner on this. Um, so we kind of decided my background in horticulture, his background in farming, and also the fact we both really love beer was a really good reason for us to kind of go down this endeavor. Uh, I was actually talking to someone today and she said, oh, did you do just a few to start? No, we didn't. We just jumped right in. We started out with seven acres our first year. And when we say that this is a family business, our son is literally growing up in the hops field here. Uh, we try to get a pic, he may not go for it this year. We try to get a picture of him out there. So between my son and my nieces and nephews and our family, um, we couldn't do this without everyone who, who helps us considerably throughout the year. So when we start looking at the history of hops, um, hops were first mentioned almost 3000 years ago in writing. And it really came, and I don't think this is a surprise from Germany. Um, and we started seeing because of the history of beer and brewing coming from that part, that's where hops were first appreciated. We do have native hops here in the United States. A lot of the hops that we're brewing with today though, have their origins in breeding coming out of those European hops. So we started seeing the development of beer recipes being written down and hops were being written down. And previous to hops, people were using things like herbs and flowers in their brewing process. The hops provide the bittering that the beer needs because essentially beer without hops is like a sugar water. It needs the hops to, to lower down those sugars and the hops, it was found, have an antibacterial effect. And so when beer was being used on long voyages, the hops were reducing the spoilage and turned out beer was the safest thing to drink um, when they were on these long voyages. Um, when we start looking at how hops have been appreciated, and this is so different from what we see today. 
um, they had this Reinheinsgebot, boat, which was basically saying beer could only have three ingredients, water, barley, and hops. At the time, they were using big paddles to stir these huge vats of beer that they were making and did not realize that yeast was growing on these wooden paddles and being transferred from batch to batch. When that started to develop and people understood that, yeast was later added to the ingredients. And I think it's so interesting to look at this beer purity law when today we see beer with Oreos in it. We see beer with all kinds of fruit in it and all these different flavors and things. But this is really, these four ingredients are the main origins of beer. Throughout the world, most hops are grown in the um, central area or slightly above, I should say, the northern part. So you can look at this map and you can see um, very few hops are grown at the um, equator. They're mostly in regions that have the temperatures that um, experience a winter and those kinds of things because the winter is actually important for encouraging the plants to flower consistently. When we look at where most hops are grown in the United States, 97% um, of hops are grown in the Pacific Northwest. So that'd be Idaho, Oregon, and Washington contribute most of the hops coming from the US. Um, now we're starting to see Michigan is a major player. Nebraska has quite a few. We think there's roughly 60 acres being grown in Iowa right now. And I say roughly because there's not an Iowa Hops Association or, or an official registry for those acres. It does take three years for those plants to meet, reach maturity. So to say that Iowa hop growers or Midwest hop growers are moving in on the um, on the foot on the map of Pacific Northwest hops growers, they're not even concerned about this. It's more of a blip, um, but we do think that there's a demand for a local product. So a few hop basics, if you will. Hops are a perennial plant, meaning they come back from the roots every year, and we're hoping that they live for 20 or 25 years. It is technically speaking a vine with a B, not a vine. A vine has tendrils that helps it to adhere as it grows. These plants have a very rough stem with um, special kind of spines on them that help them really hook on as they grow. So hops are a vine. I will probably call them a vine as we go through here tonight. The only use for hops is beer. That's it. There's always a crazy ant who's making candles or chapstick and those kinds of things, but Without fail, the only use for hops is beer. What we are harvesting from the plant is the cone that you see in the photo on the right there. Um, that little papery kind of pine cone-ish structure um, gets dried down and eventually is what goes into the beer. Every plant, and well, and I'll, let me switch around. The yellow stuff that you see in there are special kind of oil glands filled with lupulin. And lupulin is this sticky, wonderful oil that, okay, when you take a hop and you rub it back and forth, it smells like a beer. You just wanna almost lick it, but don't, it doesn't taste good. Um, but it has this deep yellow color and it's going to have the essential oils that are going to flavor the beer. Every plant in our field is a female plant. Here you can see the difference between female flowers, the little koosh ball type things on the left, and male flowers. The reason we only have female flowers is if the hop cones get pollinated, it'll actually cause the hops to set seed. It will decrease oil content while increasing weight. Our goal is to deliver a product to brewers that has a very high oil content um, in relation to the weight. So we only have female plants. Most people, 
actually, I would really only suggest that you buy plants that have been propagated vegetatively so that you know if you're getting a female plant or a male plant. They're dioecious, meaning the plants have separate, there's separate female plants and separate male plants, and only the female plants will set the hop cones. When we look at the cones themselves, like what's going on in there? Um, if you're familiar with brewing, we really, the two big things we talk about are the alphas and the betas. And those are referring to the different types of oils that are within the, um, within the hop cone itself. The values of these oils, each variety of hop is going to have a different accepted range for their oil levels. So we send our hops in for testing to verify that they're in that acceptable range before we harvest. Um, and with all of these things, it really comes down to the skill of the brewers who are able to take these hops and utilize them to create some fantastic beers. So while it might not be common to use a hop like Cascade in a stout, the right brewer can come up with these amazing recipes and processes that could make that work possibly. So I talk a little bit about hop varieties here. I usually relate hop varieties to apples because there's certain types of apples that you eat fresh and there's other apples that are good for baking and they have different purposes. And it's kind of the same with hops. Um, different hops are gonna be used for different styles of beer. And there's going to be some flexibility there. The other challenge for us as growers is that beer is kind of trendy, right? So like a few years ago, it was all about hazy IPAs. Like that was it. We didn't have all of these different soured beers and some of the fruity beers and some of those things. So as the beer trends change, the different hops being used for those beers have the potential to change too. And that's the challenge because it takes us three years for plants to reach maturity. So trying to predict where those trends are going is tough. In addition, there are also some hop varieties like Citra, Mosaic, and Amarillo that are considered proprietary, meaning a group of farms and investors in the Pacific Northwest have invested lots and lots of time and money into developing and marketing those varieties. So we as a grower cannot um, get those plants. They protect them and do not make them available to the public. So when we're talking hops, a challenge for us is, as I probably alluded to, is trying to decide which varieties to grow. And I love this graphic that kind of shows some of the different aromas and flavors that you can pull out from hops. And yes, if you look on the bottom right, cat urine is an actual quality of hops. Now, do you want all cat urine? No, probably just a little bit, but you can see we have also the citrus and the tropical and the fruity. So all of these different things um, play into the hops and how they're being used. Um, we grow on our farm Cascade, so that has a lot of floral, grapefruit, citrus aromas to it. We have one called Mackinac, so that's really heavy on pineapple and tropical melon. And we have one called Crystal that's very, very light. Um, it's used a lot for ales and very kind of Pilsner's lighter beers. And it's um, much lower in those alpha oils. And it's just not as forward as some of the others. Now, when you see these, they don't have to be used on their own. A lot of times different hops are used together throughout the brewing process to create a nice balanced flavor. So I mentioned this because I think it's important at this point to say, you know, why are Iowa hops important? And if you're a wine drinker, you're familiar with this idea of terroir that where a wine grape or where a hop or where anything is grown impacts the flavor that that product produces. So hops grown in Iowa will have a little bit of a different flavor and terroir than hops grown in the Pacific Northwest. And I think it's really important that we adopt that and kind of embrace that feature um, because it's important that Iowa beers 
have a specific or a special flavor to Iowa. You know, if we're using the exact same ingredients and the exact same hops from as from the Pacific Northwest as every brewery in every state in the country, it's hard to come up with something that's uniquely Iowan. So now we're going to kind of transfer over to talking about infrastructure. And here you can see this is our field when we were under construction. Um, we laugh because if you've if you want to meet your neighbors, start putting telephone poles in the middle of a field and everyone will stop by. It was hard for us to get work done because so many people were stopping by to ask what we were doing. Um, so our structure is made up of 22 foot long poles. They're buried four feet deep in the ground. So we end up with an 18 foot tall trellis. Um, and you can see there's different size poles. The outside poles are going to be those really bigger ones, thick ones that you see on the left um, because they're bearing the brunt of the, um, of the weight and the pull. The inner ones are a little bit smaller. One of the challenges here, and I, I've taken out the photo of my husband digging, um, but because the trellis runs has wires that run both north, south, and east, west, the exact placement of the poles is very important. Um, unlike something like a fence where you could just shift over a foot or two, and if you hit a big rock, that just doesn't fly when you're working on a hops trellis because of the cross pieces there. If you're doing this at home, and I added these in here because I think there's so many neat ways that you can use hops in an ornamental fashion, um, putting it over a gazebo would is a very neat way. But thinking about the plants, the more height you can give them, the more potential hops you will have to harvest. So they also make an excellent screen. Um, you can see someone utilizing their balcony here. And I mean, come on, who doesn't want their kids playing in a teepee of hops? How awesome is that? Um, one thing to think about, and I think it's really important here, is when we're working on our trellis, we're 18 feet up. So we have to have a scissor lift out there to be able to tie the strings in the spring and do some of that work. Probably not practical for an at-home use. So think about ways where you could maybe utilize a cable and a pulley to lower that string down or raise it up and make it more accessible so that you're not, you know, kind of out there on a really tall ladder trying to do some of this stuff. The, the idea of a pulley or some other structure to lower and raise this um, keeps it much more simple and really doable, I think, for the home audience. So on our trellis, we have the first four acres have about 400 poles. We have more than 10 miles of cable running along the top of this thing because again, it's going north, south and east, west. We do put about a thousand plants to the acre and we have drip irrigation for getting those established. And you can see that black tube um, on the left side there, that's just got a little drip to it. After the first year, you're probably fine without irrigation, but getting those new plants established is really important. Um, we chose to go with plants for our field. So you can do plants or rhizomes. And rhizomes are just basically pieces of stem that are have growing points along them. So they're they end up fairly similar. Um, a plant is more expensive, but most people planting rhizomes will put two or three in one location because not all of those will grow. So it ends up being about a wash. It really depends what varieties you're looking for and if you can find them in plants or rhizomes. Um, now, remember we talked about there's female plants and male plants. There's one reason that you do not want to buy hop seeds. Um, you just don't know what you're getting. I think, you know, if you get on eBay and you see someone selling Citra hop seeds, don't do it. It's a scam. You want to make sure that you're buying this vegetative material. 
So as we look at what does this season look like right now, we are just starting to see, and, and we're a little bit late, I think, we're starting to see plants coming out from the ground. Um, we see some varieties coming up ahead of others, and that's part of figuring out what is the best hop for Iowa. Um, because of our roller coaster weather that we have in the spring, we don't necessarily want hops that come flying out of the ground on the first warm day, because sure enough, we are going to have cold weather following it. So we like the fact that some of these varieties are just starting to emerge right now um, because they should be good fingers crossed as in the next few weeks here. So again, right now we're seeing these new shoots coming up and they look like little pieces of asparagus coming up from the crown of the plant. They're about the size of a pencil and we will start to see lots and lots of them coming up. We'll see um, 20 to 30 of these shoots per plant. And what we are working on, uh, uh, hmm always, every morning, every night, is hanging the strings that these plants will grow on. You can see the strings there in the photo on the left and what they look like on the right. Um, we use a coconut fiber string. It's called Core, C-O-I-R. And the reason we use this coconut fiber string is it's very rough so the plants can grow up it and wrap as they go around, but it's also strong enough to make it through a full season. Um, these plants are gonna be heavy by the end of August here, especially if they're heavy and wet and it's windy, there's a lot of pull on those strings. So we need this to be strong enough, but we also need a natural material that will be able to go through the harvester without plugging that up. So um, we, I know people have tried different things, but without reinventing the wheel here, this does very, very well. So each spring we hand tie two strings per plant. We're probably gonna do one on some varieties this year, but two strings per plant up on the top there. You can see the little hitch knot that we use. Then we drop the string down and we use this little handy device called the W clip that pins that string into the ground until the plants can be start growing up it. Um, those are steel. So the idea is that they rust out in a couple of years and we don't have like an accumulation of little metal pieces there. But the wings on that W clip, it's so small, but it provides just enough resistance that the string doesn't pull out of the soil. Um, we tried one year to not use the W clips. And because it's so windy here, within three days, 90% of our strings were just flying around and it was a mess to try to catch them. So the W clips work for us. Um, you could use something like a sod staple or, a, or something heavy to hold it down. You just wanna make sure that whatever string you're using is secured to the ground until the plants can start growing up it. So we are getting close to the point because we gotta get those strings up where we will see these vines start to grow upward. Um, what we will do then is ideally between May 15th and the 25th, we will be training the plants. So we go through and we pick two to three vines per string and we wrap them physically around that string. That's what it takes to train it to grow upward. Um, if we did nothing at all, we would probably get some growing up, but we just want two to three. Um, it's the, it's, Research way beyond us has found that two to three strings or binds per string is the best way to optimize yield um, for that string. If you put more on, the plants kind of compete with each other. If you put less, you're not really optimizing the real estate. So, so three per plant tends to work well for us. The plants, we train them clockwise. They follow the sun from east to west as the day goes. So they will naturally grow clockwise. So we just start them out that way. Um, on the left photo, you can see kind of what they look like. We'll have shoots going everywhere. Um, we don't try to get the biggest ones. We don't try to get the smallest ones. We try to get an average three um, to get going up that string there. 
So from that training point until the end of June is a really important time. At this point, the plants are just growing straight up. They will grow six to 10 inches a day vertically. And it's really important. Our goal is to have those plants reach the top of the trellis by the summer solstice or the 4th of July. So we have between June 21st and the 4th of July. And the reason for that is the plants are growing straight up. The summer solstice, the, day, the plants can tell when the days quit getting longer and start getting shorter. And that will tell the plants to quit growing up and start growing out and put side shoots on. And the side shoots are where the hops form. So we want to get the most side shoots as we can possible. If the plants are only halfway up the trellis on June 21st, well, we'll only get half of the potential side arms as something that grows all the way up. Um, the other thing that can cause them to put out side arms is when the plants reach the top of the trellis and they physically bend over because there's nothing else for them to climb on. That too causes side arms to be produced. Now, our challenge is trying to get this timing right. Um, our first year when we didn't know any better, we had plants that hit the top wire on like June 1st and we're high five and we're so happy because these suckers are huge. Well, when they hit the top, it started to put out side arms, but then the summer solstice came and it stopped putting out side arms. And so we only had hops in like the top three or four feet of the plant. And so it's really finding that sweet spot on the timing there. So when I look at this photo from our field, I can tell that this was right at the end of June. And I know that because the plants are up at the top of the trellis, but they don't really have any side arms here. They're just straight shoots. Once those plants start to put out the side arms, then they will start, the side arms are where the flowers form. So in the left, you can see some little of those little kush ball female flowers that just opened. Again, they're about the size of a pencil eraser. As they mature, you can see the ones on the right have started to look a little bit more kind of papery. They start to look more like that hop cone, right? And those plants can, those cones continue to develop and enlarge and the oils increase. Um, so that's most of what's happening in July is we have those cones developing. Um, we make sure that the plants have plenty of water. And this is really an important time for us to watch for pests and disease in the field because we don't want those diseases and things to enter into the cones. We also at the, towards the end of July and August, as you can see, these hops are getting larger and larger. This is when we start looking for that final product to get ready. Look at those beautiful cones. Oh, I can almost smell them. Um, so what we'll start doing is monitoring those for, get, for harvesting. In the meantime, our biggest concern in the hops field is downy mildew. And the photo on the left shows these stunted shoots. Um, they call them Christmas trees, but they're, it, the downy mildew can causes those stunted side arms, which is going to reduce the flowers and ultimately the hops. Um, it can be fatal if it gets into the hop cone itself. Um, there won't be anything there to harvest. So because of that, and in today's Earth Day, so I'll mention we monitor the weather and spray fungicides according to what the weather dictates. We don't spray like every Thursday or anything like that, but we use fungicides carefully um, to take care of any potential problems. As far as pests, um, there's the potential for aphids, leaf hoppers, mites. Japanese beetles are the big ugly one that we see a lot of in late July and early August. They're terrible, they're gross. Luckily, they we found that they eat the leaves off the plant, but really don't damage the hop cone. Um, however, we know that it can't be very healthy for the plant to lose all of that um, leaf area that is ultimately photosynthetic material. So we try to take care of them, but it's also a challenge because we're getting so close to harvest that there's very few um, approved 
insecticides for those insects. So we tolerate them, they're disgusting. Um, we do sometimes see, you can see the caterpillar there on the bottom photo. This is the caterpillar of an Eastern comma butterfly. So commas and question mark butterflies will actually use hops as their larval food source. Um, there's no butterflies feeding on hops for nectar, but the caterpillars themselves will eat the plants and develop. I have a soft spot for butterflies, so we just kind of tolerate them because their damage is really minimal. And here's what we're looking at as this season develops. So as we start to get toward the middle of August, we are looking for trying to get our harvest time right. Um, we do this through testing the moisture levels in the hops. And we send samples into labs to find out if we're in that, excuse me, that ideal range for each variety on the oils. And we start to look at our harvest time. When we harvest, we cut the entire plant down. Um, so we cut the string at the very top of the trellis and we cut it about three feet from the ground. Um, we have great partners who have harvesters around the state. We don't have one ourselves. So we load them on a, a big flatbed trailer like you see here and we take off down the road to take them to someone who has a harvester. Um, Here's what that harvester looks like. Most of these are German machines. Most of them are more than 30 years old because they're just built to last. Um, and as you can see on the right side of that harvester, the harvester, you hook the string in and the bind and it pulls the entire thing in and through a series of um, knives and fans and belts, all the cones go out one way and everything else goes out another. Um, it's a super impressive machine. They're huge. So once the cones are separated, and again, this is kind of where it is fairly similar to grain crops. Warm air is pushed through these huge piles of cones to reduce the moisture levels. Um, hops, when they're harvested, are usually 24 to 27% dry matter, the rest is moisture. And we wanna actually get it down to just 11% moisture. So there's a huge range there and a huge amount of moisture that has to be pulled off slowly and with low heat because we want to retain those oils. Once those hops are harvested then, they go into a pellet mill and turned into this kind of, I call it the rabbit food form. Um, where this is the form that most brewers will prefer because it takes up less space in the brew kettles and ultimately leaves more room for, for the finished product. And I kind of skipped over this. Um, most hops are harvested through the, combo, through the harvest machine, they're dried and pelleted because then they store very well. Um, we have seen a, a trend and we're lo we love seeing it where breweries are using fresh hops in the brewing process. So these are fresh green hops. They go from the field into the brew kettle within 24 hours. Um, they have a different flavor. It's a very pure kind of uh, fresh flavor to them, a little bit of, different, of difference than, than the processed ones. Um, the challenge here is getting the timing. We have to work really closely with the brewers to um, let them know what we're thinking on the harvest timing so that they can have the brewing space available. Um, but it's really special because it's a, it's a small window for which we see these being produced. So we work primarily with Iowa craft breweries. Um, and people will say, well, how much hops does beer use? And this is kind of a loaded question because it depends a huge amount on the brewer and the style of beer that they're brewing. Um, but a barrel of beer is about 30 gallons. And some breweries will use as little as two to four pounds per barrel of beer. Um, so four pounds for 30 gallons of beer. Um, our goal, and 
I think I need to update this slide because it's really closer to a thousand pounds is what we're finding to be more realistic for a harvest value. Um, so we look at about a thousand pounds per acre. So on a seven acre field, that's the potential for a lot, a lot of beer there. Um, when people ask about, you know, are we doing more? Right now we're not. We need to be able to make what we have work and be sustainable. And I, I, this is me getting on my soapbox here. You know, I don't expect everyone on here to go say, hey, have you heard of Cedar Falls hops? But just ask the brewers if they've used any local hops. Um, that's a great way to kind of start that conversation. Um, again, creating a uniquely Iowa product um, because we have some fantastic breweries in our area who really have done some special things with the hops grown throughout the state. We do package in small amounts um, for home brewers too. And I think that's all I have. So I don't know if there's any questions. I would be happy to answer them here. Well, folks are thinking on that and please feel free to pop those in the chat for us and we will be sure and get those answered for you. But Carrie, why don't you talk a little bit um, for folks about maybe some of the challenges that you have faced over the years. Yes. Um, to be honest, our biggest challenge is marketing. Um, we kind of naively thought that, and this was in 2016 when we were planning to move here, um, laws and things had been changed to make craft breweries more um, favorable throughout the state. And so we're seeing a lot of breweries going up. And so we naively thought like local beer, local hops, like this is an easy choice, right? Um, but we faced a lot of hurdles in convincing brewers that we can create a high quality crop here in Iowa and also that it'll be consistently high quality. So that's something that we are still working to overcome and, and just trying to get those folks to try something new um, if they haven't done it before. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carrie, we've got some questions coming in now, so okay. you're going to be busy. How can gardeners transplant hops plants? Right now is a great time to transplant those because there isn't too much growth on them. So try to find that central crown, that growing point, and dig up as much soil around it as you can. Um, put it into its new home as soon as possible and water it really well. Right now is a great time because the plants are still fairly dormant, so there won't be a ton of growth and you could do that. Um, people usually want to know if they can grow hops in containers and you can grow them in containers. I just suggest use the largest container you can find, like one you can barely put your arms around because these plants are going to need a lot of water as they get really big. And so a small container, you're just going to have a hard time getting them enough moisture. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carrie, can you talk a little bit about the poles themselves and where did you get your poles? Yes, our poles are a combination of red pine and yellow pine. Um, I'm thinking I, uh, I can double check on this. I think the red pine are the stronger ones. So those are the larger poles that we have on the outside of the field. Um, they came from Colorado, I believe. And we worked with someone to source those for us and they, they delivered them right to the field. Um, if we're being really honest, there's several hop growers who have decided that this is not for them throughout the state. So there's used polls available if you're interested. And um, my email's there. So if you're if you are looking for used polls, let me know and I would be happy to put you in touch with those folks. Carrie, how about experience with dwarf varieties? You know, we hear that a lot in other fruit crops. Is there such a thing in hops? I don't think so. Um, so if like, let's say you had a smaller trellis and so you're trying to get that timing right, you know, to, to get it to the top. What you could do is, you know, on May 1st, go ahead, go in there and cut back all the shoots on your plant. 
it's a little scary, I know. Cut those shoots off and then train the next ones that are coming up so that you can try to get that timing to be correct. And I should mention, hop shoots are actually edible. So you can, you know, you can use those, you can saute them, you can pickle them, do something like that and, uh, and go down that road with them. But what you'd want to do is delay your training date a little bit. Carrie, how about suggestions for organic weed control? Well, on a, <laughs> a hard one. Like, to be honest, you're really, we're limited on weed control already. Um, you know, chemical weed control, there's a few options early in the season, um, but mostly it's mechanical, meaning you're weeding by hand. Um, most of what we're doing in the field is done by hand. Very little is done from the seat of a tractor. So um, if you look at our field, we actually have a dwarf clover that goes that is planted between the rows. For us, that works great for helping to minimize the weeds there. Some people will keep the soil bare and till it and those kinds of things. Um, you just have to kind of decide what's right for you. How about where do you send your hops for the testing themselves when it's supposed to harvest? Yes. We use a lab in Wisconsin called AAR Labs, and they're wonderful. He's a great guy to work with. Yes, he is. <clears throat> How about fertilizer types and frequency, Carrie? Yes, so in June, we are fertilizing pretty heavily. On our farm, we do a soil test in like September, October after harvest to figure out what our fertilizer needs are for the year. Then we apply a granular fertilizer in fall that gives us a lot of those micronutrients and things. And then during the summer, we use a liquid fertilizer that goes right through our irrigations. We call it fertigation um, to give the plants small amounts of fertilizer frequently through that growing period. Carrie, we talk about this one a lot with all of our specialty growers, but how big of a concern is chemical drift from other fields? It's important. It's, it's a concern. Um, I think the best thing, well, you can do two things. There's drift watch. Um, so you want to make sure that your crops are listed on drift watch. It gives you some, some protection because um, applicators are supposed to check drift watch before applying. Um, and, but I think the best thing you can do is get to know your neighbors. Um, that's, you know, we have fantastic neighbors who they don't want to hurt your crops either. Like, you know what I mean? Like they don't want to be held liable for those kinds of things. So talk with them about that um, and let them know so that they can make those spray decisions based on your crops. And I think that you'll find if you talk to these folks and let them know what you're doing, most of them are very easy to work with because again, they don't want to be held liable for damage either. No, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Carrie, you know, the, the pictures and when I'm up there, your hops are in an open, sunny field, uh, yeah. really nothing kind of surrounding them. You're not surrounded by timber. But we have a question of varieties that are maybe more tolerant um, of partial shade. I think all hops are going to do better in full sun. So if you decide to grow hops in more of a shady spot, you'll still have a lot of like plant material there, but your cones will decrease is my thought. Okay. How about the best hop varieties for Iowa's climate? You talked a little bit about you know, what you have personally. I know there are others that are out there. Yeah, um, so there's the big C's, if you will. So Cascade, um, Centennial, I'm drawing a blank on the other one right now. So the crystal. crystal, yes. Um, you know, there's, this is the challenge when you're starting out something new. And I can speak from our experience. Um, two years ago, we planted a variety called Southern Cross that the brewers we work with were very excited about. We were excited about it the first summer. It just grew really well. And then we found out 
in the spring, it was one of those that broke dormancy very quickly, very early. So it started growing in March when we had a couple of 60 degree days because we always have a couple of 60 degree days in March. And then when the cold weather hit, um, those plants got crown rot and we lost 90% of that variety, a full acre. Oh, it was terrible. But we were the first ones in the Midwest to try growing it here. So that's the challenge. Um, you know, reach out to some of the other growers in whether it's Nebraska, Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, kind of our range here and see what they're growing and they're successful with. Um, I even think Michigan is a little different than us because they mm -hmm. don't have that roller coaster weather. They just go from cold to warm. Um, in May, but you know, they're, they're a little bit different than we are here. Yep. Carrie, do most growers use commercial fertilizer or is animal manure an option? Yeah, absolutely. You can use animal manure. Um, if you want to top dress with that, that would certainly work. I think you'll still want to use some type of commercial fertilizer during June because the plants needs are so heavy. Um, their fertilizer needs, you'll want to kind of complement with that, but you can certainly use um, animal manure. Okay. Uh, without prying into your personal finances and situation, what is the ballpark of expected return income per pound of harvested hops? We are still waiting for a, <laughs> a year that is um, a positive one for us. So we are starting our fifth year. Um, we didn't talk about this too much, but I think the, a good estimate for establishing hops is to say twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per acre. When you look at um, your poles, your cable, your plants, um, yeah, those things. And you know, we had a lot of things like we already had the. In that same, you know, we had a well here, so we had that going for us. Um, we had a small tractor, we had a gator, like some of those things, but the infrastructure costs are very, very high um, on getting started. So we're yeah. hopeful. And again, but I should also mention like last year was not normal, right? Like 2020 was not a normal year to include in this. And that's when we really reached peak production. However, it wasn't a good time for breweries to be brewing a lot of beer. So it's, it's, I'm sorry, I can't give you like a real direct answer, but it, it's a tough, tough one to figure out there. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie, you and I have not talked about this before, but does it take a certain license or any kind of permitting from the state to grow for human consumption? No, it doesn't. No. Nope. Um, hops are actually exempt from some um regulations and things because they are used in a in the brewing process the product gets boiled and it's still sanitary or it's sanitized if you will because it's in that boiling process so you do not have to worry about some regulations like other crops would absolutely uh carrie we have a question of what to expect the first year of growing hops and i'm assuming they're meaning kind of you know your actual production harvest itself yes um, the numbers that are used a lot are that you get 10% your first year, 50% your second year, and 80 to 90% your third year. Um, you can increase that a little bit, I think, by using plants instead of rhizomes and getting those plants in the ground as soon as possible. So if you got them in the first week of May, you're gonna see substantially more cones than if you plant the third week of May. And that that May month is really, really important for how many hops you'll get your first year. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie, how about do you sell rhizomes or young plants for home brewers? Yeah, yeah, we have some available. We've got okay. seven acres of hops, so we can All always right. find a few extra. Her email is right there, folks. <laughs> Uh, Tom is asking, who are some of the local breweries that you supply? Uh, we work with Single Speed. They're right here in, in our area. We've also worked a lot with Confluence. Um, some of the smaller, newer breweries have been just wonderful, too. Um, Limestone Brewing in Osage and Fat Hill Brewing up in Mason City have been really great supporters, too. And we've done some with, with Peace Tree and... 
second state here in Lark Brewing and, and we try to, we don't discriminate. We are happy to work <laughs> with anyone. So reach out to all. Yeah. Uh, we had one that says my mom has three or more hops plants and one is already up to six feet high in Southern New Jersey, but the others aren't. Could they be different varieties? Yes. Yep, I think that that's too. a fair assumption. Yeah. And we talked a little bit about these two on the investment per acre and that average return um, after three years. So um, I'm going to skip over those and go to what kind of soil works best? Um, you want good draining soil. Hops plants are not going to be very happy if they're if they have what we call wet feet or if they're sitting in moisture. So there's an advantage to sandy soil, if you will. Um, I'll tell you, ours is very loamy, kind of you know that great Iowa soil. Um, but that field that we have them in is tiled to make sure that we're not staying too wet. Um, but in the Pacific Northwest, they're growing their hops basically in sand and they are putting all the nutrients and things onto the plants through their fertilizer injectors, through their watering system. So you can, if your soil is lacking, you can make up for it in other ways. There you go. Uh, Carrie, is Great Lakes hops a good source for hop plants? I think so. That's where we got all of our plants from. They're great to work with and they literally have close to a hundred different varieties of hops. Um, available for you to choose from. Have you heard of contracts with local brewers or anything like that? Or do you feel like that's too risky for them to make that commitment? Um, that's a great question. So in, let's call it five years ago, um, prices for hops went through the roof. There was a huge warehouse fire out in the Pacific Northwest and a large portion of the year's harvest for hops were lost. That was also when craft breweries were popping up like crazy everywhere. So the price for hops skyrocketed. That caused a lot of brewers to get under contract, but then the prices went back down to where they should be, but they were under these really outrageous contracts from a few years earlier for like five years. Um, so it seems like because of that, we are not seeing much interest in contracts um, from brewers. We're also seeing the brewing trends and things are changing so fast right now. Like it feels like before breweries used to have like their four or five flagship beers and occasionally they would do a special release. That's totally changed from what we're seeing today where breweries are doing a release in some cases like Confluence releases a new beer every week. They still have their flagships, but they're really focused on these different beers. So I think that that does not lend itself as much to the contracts that we wanna be able to spot by so that they have the flexibility on those things. Mm -hmm. I would just kind of echo that, um, not having done hops in the past, but just local foods in general in sales to uh, restaurants and institutions, they seem to kind of shy away from those contracts. What they're really looking for is that relationship. Yes. So, Carrie, what about the best hop plants for a piney note? For what? A piney note. Oh. <laughs> um, hmm. I will be honest, I don't love a piney note in my <laughs> beers, so I'm not like as familiar with those. Um, you know, Cascade usually has a bit of pine in it, but we're not finding that for Iowa grown Cascade. Um, so with, I don't want to make something up here. So I would suggest looking at like the Great Lake Hops website and they're going to list the characteristics for each hop there. So you can kind of focus in on one that lists that pine um, aroma as, a, as one of the forward flavors. Okay. Carrie, can you talk a little bit more about uh, the type of cable that was used between your poles and then the spacing on your poles themselves? Yes. Um, 
the cabling itself if you want the exact specifics of the cable i'm going to have ask you to email me because i just don't remember and and i will come up with something that's not correct um, but i can tell you that the spacing for us our field runs north south so going north south the poles are 44 feet apart and then east west is where we have those rows and those rows are our rows are 14 feet wide so east to west we have the poles every 28 feet um, every other row has poles in it so the east west cables are actually supporting the north south cables in the way that it's laid out and I and I have a diagram if you, if you want to see that those exact specifics, please reach out and I would be happy to send that along. Okay. And I should say, um, we'll we love having visitors here too. So if you'd like to come towards Cedar Falls and and if you want to come this Saturday and hang some strings and get some hands on experience, we would love to have you. Um, but any time of year, we we welcome folks to come take a look. Well, aside from wet hops, do hops always have to be pelleted to sell to breweries? Um, yes. There's really um, no they, way around it that that's really how those brewers want that. And that's how they are used to purchasing and ordering and utilizing yes. the hops themselves. So yes. you're competing already with that factor. Yes, um, home brewers may have interest in your dried hops and I've seen people, um, you know, if you have a small amount of hops, let's say you have a few plants, you can kind of put those between two window screens and then put a fan on the bottom to force the air up to dry them. And then you want to put those in like a Ziploc, try to get as much air out as possible and then put them in the freezer. Um, we're super fortunate we have a meat locker near us that lets us rent some space so we put once our hops are pelleted they go directly in the freezer until we ship them out to a brewery um, the freezer helps preserve all of the oil content so even if you're not pelleting but you still have whole what we call a whole clone hop go ahead and keep those in your freezer carrie is there a minimum number of plants that a beginner should start out with If you plan to work with a brewery, I think you need to consider the harvesting side of things. So what I would do, I would reach out to some of the folks who have harvesters and find out what their minimum number of plants is for you to take them there for the harvesting machine. Um, so in Iowa, Buck Creek Hops is in Solon and they have a harvester, I would give them a call, find out what their minimum number of plants is. Um, if you're in Northern Iowa, Civil Sass Hops has a harvester and will do custom work too. So reach out to folks who have the harvesters to find out what their minimum is. Does that make sense? Yeah. That makes total sense, that's great. Uh, because if you have to, I should say this, if you have to hand harvest your plants, expect to spend an hour per plant hand harvesting um, so if you start to look at an acre or a half acre like we don't have enough friends or enough beer to like make that work like you need to think about how to make less work instead of more absolutely uh, do fresh hops not give up their oils as well as the pellet hops Good question. I'm guessing whoever asked that has tried using fresh hops before. Um, we, I think what we're seeing is that breweries are getting better at using fresh hops and they find that they need to like pulverize them or like be rough with them, like in a way they wouldn't have to with the pellets to get those oils to be released. So I think the answer is yes, they they hold on to them a little bit more. So whether you're um, crushing them or doing some process like that, I think it's important to, to get those oils out. And then you also need to look at the 
a pound of dried hops is not equal to a pound of wet hops. So it's about four to one actually. So you need about four pounds of wet hops per pound of dry hops to get the same oil content. Yeah, really good point. Uh, Carrie, how about as a homegrown non-tested hop, how do you estimate the alphas and the betas? Just use the whole hops for late addition or can you use the bettering addition? I'm going to assume that you know what kind of hop it is. Is, do you, is that what you took from the question that they know what kind it is, but not the actual Yeah, I testing? would assume, yes. Um, so I would go with an average for that hop variety. Um, wait until they're very, very fragrant. I think, I know I always want to harvest early, right? Because they, they still smell good, even though their oils aren't at their peak. So wait until they're very, very sticky and they're very, very fragrant and it's a deep golden yellow color inside. And then at that point, I would go with the average, some middle number for that range of acceptable oils. We've reached the end of our questions. Okay. <laughs> uh, Carrie's email is on the screen. So if anybody has additional questions, she is incredibly giving uh, with her information and her time. So please don't hesitate to reach out to either Carrie or myself. Uh, oh, Carrie, I lied. We just had one more come in. Okay. Um, how about experience with to Toma hops? Tahoma. Um, I do not have any experience with those. Okay. So I, I'm afraid I, I can't say for sure. Okay. Um, appreciate everybody's time tonight and everybody's attendance. Please don't hesitate to reach out if we can answer any additional questions. Um, but otherwise, Carrie, thanks so much for your time and expertise as always. My pleasure. Thank you all.